Hello everyone, welcome back to one of Labour for Learning's Poetry Analysis. Today we'll be looking at God's Grandeur by Gerald Manley Hopkins. Hopkins' finely crafted sonnet, God's Grandeur, was written in 1877, the year Hopkins was ordained as a Jesuit priest. Hopkins is considered to be one of the greatest poets of the Victorian era. However, because his style was so radically different from that of his contemporaries, his best poems were not accepted for publication during his lifetime, and his achievement was not fully recognized until after World War I. Hopkins was concerned about the dirtiness and corruption of industrialization. Thematically, Hopkins' poems focus on nature and God, that is, he sensed that God is suffused and accessible through nature and his resulting concern about the destruction of nature by people and the forces of industrialization. Most crucial for Hopkins is the second industrial revolution, which led to widespread degradation of nature from the exploitative mining and harvesting of natural resources, pollution emitted by factories, and the expansion of urban and suburban spaces into what was formerly wilderness. Let's uncover the poem's meaning. Hopkins' God's Grandeur is a sonnet in which Hopkins conveys his reverence for God. In the first eight lines of the sonnet, Hopkins describes a natural world through which God's presence runs like an electric current. He believed that the whole universe is evidence of God's might. However, he felt that man does not recognize God's power. He opines that the universe constantly renews itself replenishing its natural beauty despite man's destruction of it. He suggests that this is only possible because God continues to brood over it. So let's look at the poem, God's Grandeur by Gerald Manley Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, oh, oh, morning at the brown brink, eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah uh, bright wings. Let's now look at a line by line analysis of the meaning and methods used in the poem. The poem begins with the line, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. This line is a declarative sentence and a metaphor to compare the grandeur of God to an electric force that charges, that is, that permeates and brings to life, and in this case brings to life the world. Lines 2 to 4, it will flame out like shining from shook foil, it gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed, extends the idea of this metaphor comparing God's grandeur to an electric charge. The speaker makes that description much more tangible to the reader by using a simile to compare the flame of God's charge to the metallic reflections created by shaking a piece of metal foil. So imagery is created here, this line as well. He continues with the simile. This simile of oil further develops the idea of how God is suffused into nature. And then the word crushed here marks a shift in the poem. That shift is extended into line four with the rhetorical question, why do men then no wreck this rod? Now this rhetorical question is a turning point in the poem and it turns the poem on its head, signaling a shift in mood and tone. Then in the middle of that rhetorical question, makes clear that the speaker has made reference to what he or she described in the opening lines previously. Um, so this means that when he mentioned that the world is filled with God's grandeur and all the goodness that comes with that, the shift here is with the word then in the middle of this rhetorical question is referencing the fact that since the world is filled with all this glory and grandeur and greatness, why then, 
why is it that mankind has decided to wreck his rod now hopkins invites us into a discussion of the de devastating impact that the natural world faces as a result of mankind he repeats in the in line five generations have trod have trod have trod and uses the past tense verb trod meaning to walk demonstrating how instead of stopping to wreck god's power mankind moves incessantly without ending forward over the earth arguably suggesting the relentless weight mankind has put on the world line six and all is seared with trade bleared smeared with toil are vivid verbs here highlighting the destruction caused by the action described in the previous line the poem continues with the alliterative use sound in smudge and smell and these words put the blame of this destruction on mankind itself emphasizing the power of these corrupting forces nature will heal itself seemingly undaunted with the ability to restore life and life itself in line nine the poet heralds the speaker's resolution to the poem's core problem there's a turn here not in response to the rhetorical question but instead the speaker offers a journey towards hope in the face of destruction he says here never spent in line nine he continues there lives the dearest freshness deep down things the alliteration of the repeated d sound implies a return to nature's innate order and congruence suggesting that peace always exists deep down even if not obvious to the human eye the poem continues in lines 11 to 12 with the idea of rebirth with tangible ideas of how this would happen with images of sunset last lights of the black west and in line 12 the sunrise springs over the eastern horizon the enjambment at the end of line 11 into 12 possibly reflect how smoothly day and night connect in a never-ending cycle the last two lines of the sonnet give details about god's watch the holy ghost over the entire world and the entire buoyant natural loop described in lines 9 to 12. line 13 presents a new metaphor describing god's role identical to mother nature nurturing and motherly the adjective bent continues to portray the idea of a world that is still broken however the verb broods conjures the image of a god who carefully nurses the world as a mother bird would tend to eggs or hatchlings here are four of the methods that hopkins used in his poem alliteration occurs in essentially every line of god's grandeur covering consonant sounds such as grandeur of god in line one and vowel sounds such as seared smeared and blared in line six the incredible amount of alliteration in god's grandeur is no accident the repetition of sounds that the use of alliteration creates allows a poet to play with the intensity of the imagery and rhythms of a poem in general and to focus the reader's attention on places where the alliteration is active in god's grandeur hopkins uses alliteration to achieve both of these effects so for example grandeur of in in the line or the phrase grandeur of god is made more grand by its alliteration where the speaker's disgust at the way that nature now wears man's smudge and shares man's smell is similarly intensified by the alliteration of this in that phrase hopkins also uses metaphors he uses two different metaphors to describe god's relationship in the first metaphor which appears in the first line of the poem he likens god to a kind of potential that suffuses and charges nature this is central to hopkins ideas about god and nature in which god is both at work through nature the second metaphor appears in the last two lines of god's grandeur the speaker describes the holy ghost brooding with warm breast over the bent world in this metaphor the holy ghost appears as a mother bird hovering protectively over the world which is itself metaphorically linked to a broken egg god's grandeur is largely made up of a rhetorical question why do men then know not wreck his rod this question serves as a turning point in the poem um, the rhetorical question in this line sets out the sonnet's proposition 
which is a term for the problem that is usually presented in the first octave of a Petrarchan sonnet of which God's grandeur is one. Now, one of the most common uses of rhetorical question is to challenge the reader, which is what the poem uses it for here. Another method used in the poem would be similes, and the poem employs two different similes in lines two, three, and four. Both similes are nested within a broader metaphor of the charge of the grandeur of God. So the first one compares God's charge to the kind of light that would reflect off a piece of metal foil. It would flame out like shining from shook foil. The second simile likens that same charge to the valuable oil of a fruit like an olive. It gathers to greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Continuing with method, two structural method that the poem um, uses would be enjambment. And enjambment is the running over from one line into the other. So enjambment occurs in four places in God's grandeur at the ends of lines 3 to 4, 7 to 8, 11 to 12, 13, and 14. Now, in each case, Hopkins uses enjambment, sometimes in conjunction with Caesarea. So if you were to look at the poem now, um, you would see that the lines run into each other. The enjambment at the end of a sentence about a sunset causes the line to continue right into the next one about a subsequent sunrise, emphasizing the connection between sunrise and sunset. So the lines flow into each other, in other words. Now, in terms of the caesura, that occurred in lines 2 to 6, 8 to 9, and 12 to 14. It's an, it sounds like a sophisticated term, but all it is is a pause. So the caesura works here to increase the focus or stress on a particular word, phrase, or idea. So if we were to look at line 4, the Sasura creates a sensation that embodies the actual word crush. So where he said um, that it's crushed, it creates that sensation with a sense of rushing from line three and then being forced to, to stop. Just one word into line four, feeling a bit like running into a wall. So he wanted to create that um, intensity there at the end of that line by pausing and reinforcing the idea that the reader needed to stop and reflect on the fact that the soil is no bare to fully register the speaker's despair at this turn of events. Now, if we were to look at form, meter, and rhyme, we will note that God's grandeur is an Italian sonnet or a Petrarchan sonnet with 14 lines divided into two parts. The first eight lines is an octave, which is further divided into two four-line quatrains. The remaining six lines are called a sestet made up of two three-line tercet. Now, the fact that God's grandeur follows the pattern of an Italian sonnet. In the octave, Hopkins sets out what is called a proposition, which establishes the problem in the poem. Then the sestet then begins with what is called a turn, marking a shift in the poem's focus from presenting a problem to resolving that problem. In God's grandeur, the problem presented is a bit bigger than the unrequited love Italian sonnets would usually feature. And here, in, in God's grandeur, the, the fact that humanity has destroyed much of nature and in the process lost the ability to sense God's charge in nature. Now, in regards to the meter, though the poem is a sonnet, it does not conform to other Italian so sonnets written in iambic pentameter. So even when the poem uses iambic pentameter, it often subverts the rhythm created by the meter. It does this particularly in the first octave of the poem as in the second line. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. So the comma used in the middle of that line uh, creates a pause that interrupts the meter's rhythm. So in the poem, then, the speaker is both creating the rhythmic nature of iambic pentameter and laying other rhythms against it, similar to the concept of counterpoint in music, so you can get how nature is being disturbed by man. When looking at the rhyme scheme of God's grandeur, we need to note that Hopkins follows the Italian sonnet rhyme scheme exactly. That's A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D. Now, Hopkins is able to sometimes focus intense pressure on individual words or phrases like crushed the soil and to layer multiple rhythms over and against each other in a way that mirrors the layered complexity of the world of man, God and nature that the poem describes. Let's explore two of the main themes central to the poem, industry and destruction. 
During the Victorian era, many were concerned about the fast pace at which industrialization changed the physical landscape, especially in the, in the capital. Likewise, in the poem, everything is shifting and changing and moving. For better or worse, the potential runs through the entire poem. The persona's vision is at once apocalyptic and full of bursting green life, as he or she both laments change and yearns for it. God, Nature and Man The speaker in God's grandeur looks deeply at the natural world and doesn't hold back his or her contempt for the ways in which people and their industries have treated nature. Yet, Hopkins claims that the consequences of man's treatment is only on the surface, exploring the idea of renewal, both for a damaged earth and for the damaged people who walk upon it. Now, if we look at the poem's message, or big ideas, Hopkins wrote God's grandeur as a praise of God's glory. He illustrates his excitement about the everlasting presence of God and his resentment for the destruction of the world caused by people. Hopkins argues that the world is filled to the brim with God's splendor and glory. He comments upon the approach of a murdering man whose involvement and labor has corroded the real beauty of the earth. And lastly, Hopkins contends that though mankind destroys the earth, it still harbors life because God restores it. Just as a reminder, your big ideas are not explicitly stated. These are the inferences you would have made having read the poem. Now, if you are asked to compare the poem, then you would compare it to sonnet composed upon Westminster Bridge by William Wordsworth. Because in this poem, Wordsworth conveyed his love for nature, but finds a beautiful, clear scene of the London skyline spread before him while he crosses the bridge, as quiet and lovely as anything to be found in nature. You could also compare it to West Indies, USA by Stuart Brown, in that the persona takes offense and states that America does not want blacks in San Juan, implying that they might be a disruptive force, compared to the idea that man is a disruptive force. Or finally, you can compare to an African thunderstorm in which Rubadiri juxtaposes an African thunderstorm to the invasion of Westerners, destroying the land and the people. Similarly to how Hopkins illustrates that mankind destroys the earth, harbors life only because God restores it. And there you have it. Gerald Hopkins finely crafted sonnet, God's Grandeur, written in 1877. I hope you will now agree with me that he was indeed one of the greatest poets of the Victorian era. To continue to receive analysis of poems from the CSEC 2018-2023 collection, remember to like, share, and subscribe. See you soon.